On February the 2nd this year, Andre Karpathy, an OpenAI founder and formerly head of AI at Tesla, introduced a new term for a style of programming with AI assistance. He called it vibe coding. Now, I'm no stranger to the ideas of too long didn't read and semantic diffusion, but I think that this might have been some kind of record. This was a thousand character tweet, and it seemed that few people even got to the second half. Andre describes what he means by vibe coding in the first 300 or so characters of a thousand character tweet. The rest describes some of the consequences of this naive toy town approach to programming. Now, I don't know Andre personally, so I can't tell what he had in mind with his tweet, but it reads to me as sarcasm. Near the end of the tweet, he says, it's not too bad for throwaway weekend projects, but it's not really coding. I just see stuff, say stuff, run stuff, and copy and paste stuff, and mostly it works. So I think that Vibe Coding is at least up for the prize of the worst software idea of the year so far. Nevertheless, it seems to have gone viral and now is a well-known phrase in our domain. And so that's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley and welcome to the Modern Software Engineering channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content, hit like. It helps us reach a bigger audience. Thank you for your help. The idea and reality of having a relaxed chat with a large language model that results in a working system is impressive and seductive, but it seems to me to miss the point almost entirely of what programming is really about. This gets us back to that blight of the software industry, the idea that writing code is the hard part. Non-technical people believe this is true because code looks so complex and mysterious to them. Developers believe that it's true because code is comforting and precious to them and clearly defines their skills and separates them from the non-technical people who presumably aren't as smart because they can't read the code. We've built a technical recruitment industry on this premise that the defining characteristic of a good programmer is the set of languages and frameworks that they know. We have people who define their jobs by the tools that they use. I'm a Java programmer, I'm a React developer, and so on. I've admitted before that I have hired programmers who haven't used the same technology that we were using on a project, and I've never regretted that so far. In my experience, you can learn a programming language if you're good at programming, enough to get by with it in a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. Doing software development well is hard, very hard, but the difficulty is not created by programming languages. So let's think about the starting point in Andre's tweet. We can give in to the vibes and forget that the code even exists. Well, the other group of people that do that are the sometimes non-technical people who want to achieve something via a computer. Up to now, though, we human programmers have played the role of the coding assistant in this conversation, translating what it is that they want into something that works. So how well does that usually go? Not so well, I'd argue. Certainly very poorly for any software of any size or complexity, this often goes very poorly indeed. And so far, we humans are still smarter than the machines. This isn't because it's so difficult to translate what people want into a programming language. It's because it's so hard to bake problems down into the precise deterministic instructions that LLM or not are still how computers ultimately work. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts and Transfic. Transfic is a financial technology company applying advanced continuous delivery techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. Both of these companies though offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, please do click on their links in the description below and check them out. If you look at programs from years ago and modern programs, there's something kind of weird going on. There's seemingly a persistence, a consistency to the level of detail that we need to express to make a working program. And that's been true for decades. However, we encode the level of detail that we need to define, it's pretty consistent. 
Programming languages aren't strange because of some fashion or masochistic trait in programmers. They are tools that have evolved to be good at expressing an idea clearly and with the required level of precision to achieve an outcome from the box of billions of switches that make up a modern computing device. Programming languages aren't more complex than real-world human languages. They're simpler, more strictly constrained and more precise. That's to our advantage in trying to achieve our goals when programming. Programming languages are tools that are designed to help us to structure our thinking so that we can decompose problems into the steps that are necessary to achieve the outcomes that we are striving for. So the idea that we can do better if we adopt a vague, imprecise, expressive richness that's in human languages to precisely define behaviours in a computer seems to be very far from the truth and missing the point almost entirely to me. So vibe coding is not even close to being the right answer, really. Another example of humans attempting to achieve clarity and precision with natural language is the law. And if you've ever had to read any legal document for any purpose at all, I think you'll agree with me that this is not really what we might hope for in terms of clarity and precision. We can think of the act of programming from a variety of different perspectives. I'm sure that most, the most common way to think of this is probably to think of the act of writing code in a programming language. But I am somewhat sceptical of the use, utility of this. It's rather like defining a plumber in terms of their use of a wrench. There's more to it than that. And the things beyond the syntax and organisation of code are more interesting and more complicated parts of programming. The shapes that we paint with the code and the outcomes we achieve with it are both more interesting and more useful than the code itself. I think that ultimately there are three goals for programming languages that really matter. One, to help us to organise our thinking about a problem. Two, to communicate our understanding to other humans. And three, to tell a computer what we want it to do. Each of these is important to the act of programming and represent different levels of value in the programs that we write. The hardest part of programming seems to me understanding the problem that we're faced with in enough detail that we can see that whatever we come up with is likely to make a good solution. Programming languages solve this problem by giving us tools to constrain our thinking in ways that help us to compartmentalize our picture of the solution that we're aiming for so that we can scope it and manage the complexity of it. They allow us to deal with parts of the problem separately from other parts, using techniques like modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, abstraction, and managed coupling. This kind of thinking about writing programs is a mix of programming language constructs that help us to build these structures into our code and our innate knowledge and understanding of design that we build up from experience. Programming languages can help to steer our thinking via their design and the rest then is down to us. A big problem for us as programmers and for large language models as programmers is that we need to learn to apply some sense of good taste in our design choices to make effective use of these language constructs. And we've all seen enough counterexamples to know that not everyone does that. But our poor large language models have been trained on all the code. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And unfortunately, there's more bad and ugly out there than there is good. And we, as a profession, have also not been very good at defining what good really looks like to differentiate it from the bad and the ugly. If you ask 10 programmers to tell you one thing that makes the difference between good code and bad, you'll probably get 15 different answers. This means that large language models are probably not going to have a great sense of what makes good code from their training data. So we either have to tell them or accept them creating bad code. And to be fair, this is all rather complex and nuanced because what makes great code in one context may be too simple or might be overkill in another. I certainly have my own set of defaults, and my book is an attempt to define some generic cornerstone ideas that I think are general enough to help. But even then, it's still contextual. My background and experience has led me to a reasonably defensive evolutionary approach to design and development. I think that the strongest mental approach is to assume that our guesses, whatever they might be, are probably wrong, and so work in ways that allow us to correct that when we find out where we're wrong. I believe that the only meaningful measure of quality in our code, then, 
is our ability to change it. So I always strive for the simplest, easiest to read, easiest to change solution that I can find. But what does ease of change really mean when a large language model rewrites all of the code from scratch nearly every time, however small the change? Does that mean that all the code is now equally easy to change? Well, not really. The code's only easy to change if we can also determine that after each change, however big or small, it still does everything that it's supposed to. But how can we determine that unless we specify it in detail precisely what our system is meant to do? For humans, this sense of what is it meant to do is often implicit. It isn't usually written into the code. But for AI-generated code, that's an even bigger problem. I think there are three big problems that the use of AI in programming highlights for us. How do we specify what it is that we want with any degree of precision? How do we confirm that, what we, that we got what we wanted? And how do we retain our ability to make measurable progress in small controlled steps? The first problem goes to the vagueness and imprecision of natural language. The second highlights the even more important role of automated testing for code written by an AI. And the third is about another quite deep problem, the profound difference between the way that machines write code and the way that we humans do. Fundamentally, this matters because of our ability to reliably reproduce a result. All successful systems evolve over time. That means that we need to be able to change them when our circumstances or our understanding changes. Humans who are good at building complex systems do so by compartmentalizing the problems so that they can retain their ability to make change safely in one part of the system without those changes leaking out into other parts of the system. This is true in physical engineering as well as software engineering, and it results in all complex systems being built in this sequence of small changes, however we organize the building of them. So my idea that the definition of high quality in software is defined by how easy it is to change is, I think, rather important because we must nearly always be able to change it. This highlights the importance of ideas like continuous integration and continuous delivery for building complex software systems. To me, this is independent of whether or not we use AIs to write the code. AIs, though, don't write code the way that we do. Most of them generate the code from scratch, often after every small change. Ironically, this same problem in ignoring the importance and ability to revisit and correct or enhance code has been the stumbling block that has seen off every other attempt at raising the level of abstraction in programming, from 4GLs and model-driven development in the 1990s to low-code and no-code systems now. They are all built on the assumption that the code would be right first time and wouldn't need correcting and so round tripping the ability to go back to existing code and correct or enhance it was difficult if not impossible. Many of these attempts were not even version controllable and we seem to be in danger of making the same mistake yet again with AI programming. Ignoring the problem of being able to update the code is stupid because it relies on us and the world being perfect and neither of us are. AI has this problem, and it doesn't at the same time. If it can recreate each even complex software from scratch given some instructions, then do we still really need incrementalism? I think there are two answers to this, but neither line up with vi well with Vibe coding. If I, as a human programmer, build a complex system, complex enough so that I can't hold every last detail of what I want and what I did in my head, and now I want to make a small change to it without breaking things, I can only be confident of my ability to do that in two ways. I can test everything and then run all my tests again later to confirm that they still pass, or I can design my system in a ways that allow me to change code in one part place without worrying too much about what may happen elsewhere. But that second approach is foundationally built on the assumption of deterministic in incrementalism in execution and design. Can I be confident that my compiler or language will interpret the code that I didn't change in exactly the same way as it did last time? Can I be equally confident that my AI can do the same? What do I version control to achieve this? What can I version control to achieve this? If I can do this, I only have to worry if my new change is correct and the isolation between the old code and the new code is good enough for me to rely on. 
But if I can't, I'm lost. If the AI regenerates all the code from scratch every time, or does that occasionally, or is learning new things and so changes how it interprets my instructions, then I can no longer trust it to recreate something that works as it did before. So I need to check that it does. This makes automated testing, continuous integration, and continuous delivery even more important for AI-generated code than it is for human-written code. And this isn't just me saying this. I recently saw an excellent video making the same point from an OpenAI researcher. My point and his point is that the best way to prompt an AI is with an executable specification. That is a precise, accurate example that describes exactly how the system you, that you want to build should behave in clearly defined repeatable circumstances so that these specifications both clearly define what we want the system to do and also allow us to verify that it does it. Programming moves then from specifying implementation detail to more clearly and more precisely specifying the intent of the system that we want to build. If you'd like to learn more about how to do that, check out my training course, Acceptance Testing BDD from Stories to Executable Specifications, which includes an example of programming with AI like this. So Vibe Coding doesn't address any of these problems. It's simply not good enough. Software engineering isn't dying, it's changing. I'd argue that these three problems are fundamental to the nature of code, AI generated or not. And any next step in programming must address all of them or it's not gonna work. Thank you very much indeed for watching. And if you enjoy our stuff here on the Modern Software Engineering channel, please do consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community. And if you're already a Patreon member, Thank you very much indeed once again for your support and I hope you're enjoying the privileges that you get from being a member. Thank you and bye-bye.